Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, suggest for a big applause for uh, Dr. William Cayley for his Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to work out with uh, people in the medical school because yeah. they were having the conferences. So I suggested that you should invite uh, Bill to the conference as a pleasant lecturer, uh, keynote speaker, and I'll be actually uh, benefiting from the invitation and having the lecture in the uh, main campus of Stonehenge University. Uh, actually, I didn't really think that you'd get it this year, uh -huh. but the, in the initial uh -huh. email. <laughs> 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 In the initial email when I wrote to him, I did mention that, you know, actually I thought that it would be next year. Uh -huh. um, I mentioned that you might be having a call from Sweden, uh, but could you come on November, in November uh, to this uh, the nation's number one university, Stonehenge University in Korea. And he just said yes, and I'm very glad about it. Uh, that was the anecdote behind everything. Um, uh, uh, it is my greatest honor to uh, introduce Dr. William Cayley. Uh, we call him Bill Cayley. So he, he's, he had a very interesting educational background. He got his BA from mathematics from Duke University in 1979. Very good education. And then he had actually had a dual degree with chemistry. Uh, then he went forward uh, to uh, medicine uh, in the same Duke University. So he's got an MD degree and a PhD degree as well. Oh, no, 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 no PhD. PhD. <laughs> but interesting thing I'll, I'll take a PhD. You want to? Yeah, uh, honorary PhD. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. So he had a lot of internal medicine practice, but then he decided to do science. So he did post up with David uh, Livingston, who's a fictitious professor, a uh, person in uh, Harvard School. So from there, he was working on science. One good news that I'd like to tell you is that uh, uh, in this morning when I was riding from the hotel to our university, he was mentioning that because he didn't want it to be, be seen as a doctor who does science well, so he has actually stopped seeing the patients but just concentrating on science. So that's uh, something that, a story that was kind, kind of touching to us. So from 2001, he's working in the Daniel Farber Cancer Institute as a, a leader, group leader, and a program leader, and a science investigator in uh, of Howard Hughes Medical Institute as well. So as uh, probably everybody, everybody knows that he has been working on a protein, a tumor suppressor protein called Bonchipelindo, very interesting name, BHL. And, uh, he came from the aspect, aspect of uh, uh, interest from the cancer biologist, back, and he's going to talk about it. But it turned out that it was actually in the center <coughs> of sensing the oxygen concentration. So that's uh, what he got the Nobel Prize. But he's not only working on DHL, but he has been working on other tumor suppressors like Aldi and Aldi proteins and P53 and the family members as well. So he has phenomenal numbers of the papers not just the numbers of it, uh, the papers, but he has influenced so many people in this field in the study of how we vision uh, how normal cells turn into a cancer cell and how tumor genesis really initiates and uh, gets progress. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce Bill Kelly to the Thank you. 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 Well, thank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be here. And uh, this is my first trip to Korea, and I'm having a wonderful time in this magnificent country, and I have so much admiration for the Korean people, so it's really nice uh, to be here. Uh, so here's my financial disclosure slide. Uh, 
so it, it is true I majored in mathematics and chemistry in college because frankly in the 70s and I would say even into the 80s biology was pretty descriptive and I found biology frankly very boring because there was, there was a lot of rote memorization and classification and jargon, but it wasn't very conceptual. So I liked medicine and physics and chemistry because once you understood the concept, you understood it forever and you didn't have to keep memorizing, memorizing, memorizing. <laughs> and, 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 and frankly, I was lucky because I was naturally good at mathematics, so I didn't have to study at mathematics to be good at it. Uh, and then when I was in college, I thought, but what's my career going to be? Am I going to be a, an abstract mathematician? Am I going to be a theoretical physicist? I, I, I'm not sure I was self-confident enough to do either of those things, but I thought medicine would be a career where I could apply science to humanity and I could have a comfortable uh, salary and have a nice car and, <laughs> you know, have a nice white coat. People would respect me, but more importantly, I could do maybe some good in the world. So uh, once I decided I was going to apply to medical school, uh, one of my uh, colleagues said, well, if you want to apply to medical school, it would be really good to work in a laboratory part-time to show people you have an interest in science. That will help your application. So I found a chemistry lab where I could do an independent study project in uh, the laboratory. And it turned out uh, the project I was given as a 17-year-old boy uh, was uninteresting, <laughs> unimportant, and undoable, which is a very bad combination for your first laboratory experience. And then in, in the last week of this experience, I, uh, I made the mistake, if you will, of pointing out to my professor that this entire project would never be completed because it was actually based on an artifact that had been generated by one of my uh, predecessors. And so, uh, as most professors do, he didn't thank me immediately. In fact, uh, he gave me a very bad uh, grade and, and for years, I, I would tell people he gave me a, a C plus, which is already sort of a bad grade if you're going to apply to medical school. But I thought to myself, could it really have been that bad? Could he have really given me a C plus? So I pulled my college transcript uh, this past year, uh, and I discovered that he did not give me a C plus. <laughs> he gave me a C minus. So, so this is like you know the nuclear option. This is he's now going to extinguish my scientific career. Uh, and then to make matters even worse, in the margin of my transcript, he wrote uh, that uh, Mr. Kalin appears to be a bright young man whose future lies outside <laughs> uh, the laboratory. So, so that's, how my, that's at least how my scientific career uh, began. So all of this is, is to say that 30 years ago, uh, I would have said the likelihood of getting a phone call from Stockholm at 4.40 uh, a.m. Uh, was pretty small, but that's actually when the phone call came in on October uh, 7th. And if you're a scientist, uh, if you get a phone call at 5 o'clock in the morning and it's from Stockholm, that's, that's a good day. So that was a very good day. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about von Hippel-Lindau disease. Now, uh, this is the, the lecture I had prepared before learning I, I won the Nobel Prize. So this is my research seminar. It's not a historical victory lap where we're just going to talk about things that were done 20 years ago. I will talk about the work that led to the Nobel Prize initially, but then we'll move into some newer things. Uh, we've had many, many, many talented uh, and generous collaborators. This is only a partial uh, list uh, that I show you here. So, so von Hippel-Lindau disease uh, is a hereditary cancer uh, syndrome that affects about 1 in 35,000 people. It's caused by loss of function mutations of the VHL tumor suppressor gene that's located on chromosome 3P. This is a classical two-hit tumor suppressor gene, so it's only when the maternal and the paternal allele are mutated or lost that tumors develop. The classical tumors are these blood vessel tumors called hemangioblastomas of the, of the cerebellum, uh, spinal cord, and retina. Uh, clear cell renal carcinomas, which are by far the most common form of kidney cancers, uh, and adrenal gland tumors called pheochromocytomas. And as you would predict from the knowledge that germline VHL mutations predispose to for example, clear cell renal carcinoma. If you now look at sporadic, that is to say non-hereditary clear cell renal carcinomas, you again see that both the maternal and the paternal allele have now been mutated, hypermethylated, or lost. But here, both hits, if you will, have occurred somatically, in contrast to VHL disease, where the first hit has occurred uh, in the germline. So despite my C minus, I did go to medical school. And uh, one of the things you learned in medical school was that certain tumors are particularly good 
at inducing angiogenesis. And so I knew that the tumors seen in BHL disease are very angiogenic. Here's a large uh, retinal hemangioblastoma that's being visualized by injecting the patient with a fluorescein dye. Uh, on the right is a renal angiogram of a patient with a kidney cancer. Uh, this actually used to be the diagnostic procedure of choice prior to CAT scanning. You would uh, take the patient, inject the dye, and look for the characteristic appearance of new blood vessels throughout the kidney as sort of a smoking gun that this kidney harbored a, a tumor. Now, I was so sure I was going to be a clinical doctor that I, I spent some extra time at Johns Hopkins. I became what's called the chief medical resident. Uh, and that turned out to be sort of important because, first of all, chief medical residents love rare eponymous syndromes like von Hippel-Lindau disease because if any of the students challenges their authority, they, you know, the chief resident simply starts asking them questions about diseases like von Hippel-Lindau disease, and then the student sort of says, oh, I'm not, you know, you're, you're the alpha dog. I'm not going to go near you. Uh, but the other thing the chief residents like are, are very long so-called differential diagnoses. So these are all the causes of, in this case, excess red blood cell production. So this is the so-called differential diagnosis for excess red blood cell production. So some of these causes of excess red blood cell production clearly are adaptive and, and make sense. So for example, if you're at high altitude or you have a heart problem or a lung problem where you're having trouble delivering oxygen, you're going to start to make more red blood cells to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. But certain tumors also can cause excess red blood cell production uh, because these tumors can produce uh, erythropoietin uh, ectopically. And it had always struck me as odd that the three tumors seen in von Hippel-Lindau disease made this list. And so if you put this together, the tumors linked to uh, VHL disease and, and loss of the VHL gene are highly angiogenic, and, and we soon figured out that's because they often overproduce vascular endothelial growth factor, and they occasionally overproduce red blood cells because they elaborate erythropoietin. And what VEGF and erythropoietin have in common is that they're normally induced uh, when cells or tissues are hypoxic. And so this suggested to me that the VHL protein must be part of the oxygen sensing mechanism because it looked like the oxygen sensing mechanism was broken in these tumors, and they were constantly overproducing things like VEGF and EPO. And for the students, you know, often, you know, what one, my mentor taught me, you know, every good line of experimentation actually starts with a question. Often students go right to the technology. Forget the technology. What's the question you want to work on? And if you step back, you know, the question should strike you as maybe being potentially interesting, potentially important. So the single most important decision I made in terms of this line of work was kind of encapsulated on this slide. It was the thought that this was an experiment of nature that would teach us something about oxygen sensing, and oxygen sensing seemed worthy of understanding since so many diseases are characterized by abnormal oxygen delivery. Now, we then learned from the work of uh, Greg Semenza, Peter Radcliffe, Frank Bunn, Jaime Caro, and others, that many of these so-called hypoxia-inducible genes, such as the VEGF and erythropoietin I alluded to a moment ago, were under the control of a heterodimeric transcription factor called HIF, or hypoxia-inducible factor. And we knew that the uh, alpha subunit of this heterodimer was normally degraded when oxygen was available, hence hypoxia-inducible factor. Uh, uh, the beta subunit is often frequently referred to as ARNT. So this was all known by the uh, early uh, to mid-90s. We were doing biochemical studies that strongly suggested that the VHL protein was part of a ubiquitin ligase complex. Uh, we then went on to show that the VHL protein is, in fact, part of a ubiquitin ligase complex, that in the presence of oxygen binds directly to the HIF alpha subunit and targets it for proteasomal degradation, whereas when oxygen levels are low or the VHL protein has been mutated, again, such as frequently happens in kidney cancer, uh, now HIF alpha can accumulate dimerize with ARNT and activate uh, transcription. So this answered one puzzle, why are VHL defective tumors overproducing things like VEGF? But it then begged the question, how does the VHL protein know, if you will, whether oxygen is or is not available, and hence whether it should or should not destroy uh, HIF alpha? And so uh, work uh, we did and work that was done independently by Peter Radcliffe uh, revealed that in the presence of oxygen, one of two prolyl residues on HIF alpha gets hydroxylated. Uh, and 
uh, that serves as, as the signal for the VHL protein to bind. So this generates the VHL binding site. Uh, and, and for the students, uh, I will tell you that one of the reviewers, when we submitted this paper, said this has to be wrong because it is well known that prolyl hydroxylation only takes place in the endoplasmic reticulum, and you're studying a nuclear protein, so you must be wrong. Reject. Okay? So fortunately, the editor intervened because the editor realized that's precisely why this is an important paper. This has never been seen as an intracellular signal. So don't give up if, you know, reviewer three doesn't quite grasp the significance of your findings. Now, uh, Peter's group and Stephen McKnight's group, with some minor contributions from our group, then showed that the enzymes that do the work here are these so-called Egolan or PhD prolyl hydroxylases. Uh, they use molecular oxygen to hydroxylate a hip alpha. Uh, it turns out that these enzymes uh, have very low oxidant affinities, and hence they're very sensitive to changes in oxidant availability. Uh, they require reduced iron, which explains a very old observation that iron chelators will uh, trigger a hypoxic-like response. Uh, and they also require a cofactor, which is variably called 2-oxyglutarate or alpha-ketoglutarate, that gets T-carboxylated to succinate during the hydroxylation reaction. Now, uh, when we wrote our paper in the year 2000, 2001, we suggested that, you know, maybe if you had uh, drugs that inhibited this enzyme, you could activate the HIF response, and maybe this would be good for the treatment of anemia, heart attack, stroke, uh, et cetera. Uh, I was told at the time it usually takes 15 to 20 years to go from an idea on the blackboard to an actual approved drug. Uh, I naively thought, well, that was the old days. It's, it's, this will go much faster. Uh, but it didn't go very much faster. So for example, uh, here are, are the two papers describing the phase three data for one of these prolyl hydroxylase inhibitors. So this is an orally available uh, HIF prolyl hydroxylase inhibitor that tricks the body into thinking that it's not getting enough oxygen, so the body starts making more uh, red blood cells. And so uh, the first of these drugs was approved in uh, China in 2018. This is me in Beijing watching the, the pills being made. Uh, and then it got approved in Japan, and the U.S. submission will occur uh, any day now. <clears throat> so I'm going to return now to the hip prolyl hydroxylase reaction. So uh, it turns out uh, this enzymology had been seen before in the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so, for example, you may remember that collagen gets prolyl hydroxylated as part of the maturation of collagen. But the collagen prolyl hydroxylases have extremely high oxygen affinity. So they, they don't act as oxygen sensors. Uh, you, the cells would have to be virtually anoxic before the collagen prolyl hydroxylases would become inactive. Then we learned from the work of, of Yi Zhang and others that the so-called Jumanji C histone demethylases also belong to this family. And what these enzymes do is they hydroxylate the methyl group, which is then unstable and given off as formaldehyde. And so one question in the field over the past five years or so has been, are these enzymes like the HIF-modifying enzymes? Are they oxygen sensors? Or are they like the collagen prolyl hydroxylases and relatively oxygen insensitive? And it turns out you can find examples of both. Uh, but uh, amongst the Jumanji C histone methylases, we've found that KDM6A, which is also called UTX, so this is an H3K27 <coughs> demethylase, is actually exquisitely sensitive to oxygen availability. And so this provides a surprisingly direct link between microenvironmental oxygen and histone methylation, and hence <coughs> gene expression. So this is something that we and others in the field are working on currently. <coughs> now, I want to return to the role of VHL and HIF in kidney cancer, however, because I'm a cancer biologist and a medical oncologist by training, so that's what I'm supposed to at least spend part of my time thinking about. So again, I used the word ex experiment of nature earlier. So VHL disease has been a very informative, but admittedly tragic, experiment of nature. So if you look at patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease, they're germline heterozygotes. They have a wild-type VHL allele and a defective VHL allele. Uh, but there's no evidence of haploinsufficiency. So if you have one wild-type allele, that's okay. Uh, but then what happens is they develop preneoplastic renal cysts, and if you look at the cells lining these cyst cavities, they're VHL null. So apparently in the human kidney, VHL loss causes preneoplastic renal cysts. And then over years to decades, some of these cysts will become actual tumors. And when you sequence these tumors, there are a number of stereotypical mutations involving other genes, genes other than VHL. So it's sort of like tumblers on a lock 
So the first tumbler falling is VHL, but then you need a few more tumblers to fall. You need a few more mutations and some other genes to cooperate with VHL loss. So w one, one conclusion from this is that VHL loss, although it might be a critical first step, is not sufficient to cause uh, kidney cancer. This, the same appears to be true in sporadic kidney cancers. I apologize, this is a busy slide, but the punchline here is that what Charlie Swanton and his team have done has biopsied multiple regions of the same kidney cancer as well as, when available, uh, metastatic lesions, and then done deep sequencing to look at mutant allele frequencies. And by looking at mutant allele frequencies, they can begin to reconstruct the evolutionary history of these tumors. And so, for example, th what they find is that, uh, again, VHL loss is almost always the first event, uh, but then there are other mutations that occurred in the course of that clone becoming, becoming a tumor, and you can actually see branching where some subclones have one set of cooperating mutations and another subclone has another set of cooperating mutations. So then the question was, okay, fine, these are genetically complicated cancers. VHL loss was the first step, but not the only step. By the time you are a kidney cancer, is VHL function relevant anymore? If you could restore VHL function, uh, would it matter? And so uh, in the mid-90s, we did some very simple experiments reintroducing wild-type VHL into some VHL null renal carcinoma cell lines, and we saw that the cells still grew happily on a plastic dish, but they couldn't form tumors in nude mice. So that suggested VHL function actually still mattered. If you could restore VHL function, you could suppress the growth of these tumors. And then to address the role of HIF, we did what we call necessity and sufficiency experiments. So Keiichi Kondo in the lab it took these cells and introduced into these cells a version of HIF-alpha that can't be recognized by VHL because the prolyl hydroxylation sites have been converted to alanine. And now these cells once again form tumors. Conversely, if you take a VHL null renal carcinoma cell line and eliminate HIF-2-alpha, we then did it with hairpin technology, but we now do it with CRISPR, these cells lost the ability to form tumors. And I should point out the more famous member of the HIF family, HIF-1-alpha, doesn't do this. Uh, it's really the less studied HIF-2-alpha that's the bad guy uh, here. Uh, and so this suggested that uh, suppression of HIF-2-alpha was both necessary and sufficient for VHL to begin to suppress the growth of uh, kidney cancers. So what can we do about this? Well, uh, by the 90s, a number of drug companies were already making VEGF inhibitors. And we argued if VEGF inhibitors were going to work anywhere in cancer, they should work here because here there's a pretty direct link between VHL and HIF and VEGF. And, and that turned out to be true. And some patients do well on these drugs for years, but they're not curative. And I think you would argue from first principles, Bill, why are you targeting any one HIF target? Don't you want to target HIF2 based on what I just told you? But you know, an, another take home message here for the students is beware of naysayers and beware of pessimists, because I was told for 20 years, that's stupid, Bill. You'll never drug HIF2-alpha. It's a DNA binding transcription factor. It doesn't have the usual properties. It's not an enzyme. You'll never drug it. But fortunately, Kevin Gardner and Rick Bruick at UT Southwestern ignored the pessimist. And they <coughs> identified in the so-called pass B domain of HIF2-alpha a potentially druggable pocket. They then did uh, screens at UT Southwestern and identifi identified chemicals that could bind to this pocket and in so doing induce an allosteric change such that HIF2-alpha can no longer dimerize with ARNT. Pretty good. Now, uh, I've consulted for pharmaceutical companies now for 20 years, and so what my professional drug hunter friends tell me is that these chemicals were publication grade, but not pharmaceutical grade, meaning you could publish your paper, fine, but anyone who's a drug hunter would say these are not going to be drugs. If these are going to be drugs, they have to be made more potent, they have to be made more specific, and they have to be made more bioavailable. So fortunately, the people at UT Southwestern realized that, and they outlicensed their chemicals to a startup company called Peloton Therapeutics that was recently acquired by Merck for over a billion dollars. So Peloton did classical medicinal chemistry to make those chemicals more drug-like, and then they were kind enough to provide us with a so-called tool compound that was one or two atoms different than the precious lead compound that was about to be used in clinical trials. And a uh, Chin Cho in the lab, who by the way is Korean, uh, did uh, a really nice set of experiments, and she showed that this 
tool did, uh, this tool compound did everything you would want. So when you treated human kidney cancers that lack VHL with this HIF2 alpha inhibitor, uh, Chin saw a decrease in HIF dependent mRNAs like VEGF, decreased proliferation ex vivo, <coughs> and decreased tumor growth uh, in orthotopic uh, tumor assays. And just to show you an example, here's one of Chin's experiments where she's doing a, a so called soft auger assay. So here she has VHL null kidney cancers that express HIF2 alpha, and when she treats with 0.2 or 2 micromolar of the drug, she saw a decrease in soft auger growth. Uh, but another take home message here for the students is first of all, this is a down assay. Uh, some cells that were happy aren't very happy anymore. Some complex biological phenomenon is now not happening quite as well, okay? So this is a down assay. Secondly, the most dangerous result in science is the one you were hoping for, right? Because you want to declare victory. You want to start writing the paper. This is, I'm done. Great. But if you're really being honest, you would realize that, uh, first of all, uh, I could do this with uh, Clorox bleach. I could do this with gasoline. Uh, I could do this with any of a number of things I don't want to use to treat my patients. So the question really is, uh, even though it's plausible that what I just showed you is on target, meaning the drug inhibits, in my case, HIF2-alpha, and that's why the cells are unhappy, but especially when you're doing a down assay, you should be really concerned that uh, what you're really seeing is a so-called off-target effect. So maybe this drug inhibits HIF2-alpha, but maybe it also inhibits X, Y, and Z, and it's X, Y, and Z that's making the cells unhappy and no longer able to form soft agar colonies. Now, the good news is there's a classical solution to this uh, that geneticists have known for decades, and that is to either discover or engineer or design a version of the target that's now resistant to wh whatever your perturbant is, whether it's a drug, sRNA, CRISPR guide, and see if you can reverse or rescue the phenotype, because then if you can, you're in pretty good shape. So here we, again, got lucky because Bruick and Gardner had already identified a point mutation in HIF2-alpha that basically occluded that pocket. So now the drug can't bind to the pocket, all right? So this now gives us a HIF2-alpha that's biochemically resistant to the drug. And so Chin used CRISPR to actually generate isogenic cells that either expressed HIF2-alpha or this HIF2-alpha that is insensitive to the drug, and now you rescue the phenotype. So this is sort of the gold standard that this drug is acting on target. It's also, I'm sad to say, the experiment th that we almost never do in our field, right? Because again, we want to declare victory and get that paper out. But my friends in the pharmaceutical industry tell me that 50 to 90% of the time, when they go to reproduce the findings coming out of the academic community, they're either not reproducible or they're reproducible under such a narrow set of conditions that they're not useful. So we have to force ourselves to do experiments like this to make sure that when we publish things, they're on target, they're robust, et cetera. And speaking of robustness, we, we actually did these experiments with eight different renal carcinoma cell lines that were VHL null. And so, to my surprise, some were very sensitive to HIF2-alpha inhibition, just like I just showed you, but some were not. They were insensitive to the drug, and then when we CRISPRed out HIF2-alpha, they didn't care, it seemed, about HIF2-alpha. So this was a surprise that when we started looking at more and more cell lines, there was heterogeneity. And initially, the editor and the reviewer again rejected our paper, saying, if you only understood why some cell lines respond and others don't, this would have been a lovely paper, but you don't understand that, so it would be premature to publish your paper. But fortunately, I have enough gray hairs that sometimes the editors return my phone calls, and I said, don't you understand that's one of the problems in the literature today? I'm quite sure that many people would be tempted to write a lovely paper with the sensitive cell lines and sort of brush under the rug the cell lines that didn't respond. What, wouldn't it have been better to honestly say, we did these experiments, this is what we found, this is what you might find, and maybe collectively we can figure out why there's heterogeneity. And fortunately, I, I won that argument this time. I don't always win those arguments. But uh, I'm glad I won that argument because guess what? When the drug went into the clinic, what did you see? Uh, some patients respond and some pe people don't. So for those of you who are not uh, clinicians uh, or not clinicians yet, these are so-called swimmers plots. Uh, these are data from a phase two trial in patients with advanced kidney cancer. Each bar is how long the patient remained on the HIF2-alpha inhibitor. So uh, the orientation, this is one year on therapy. The people with the black arrows are still doing well on their therapy, and I should point out this therapy is very well tolerated. The people with the yellow stars actually had their tumors uh, significantly shrink. 
So, uh, you know, so some of the people seem to be benefiting, and I should point out that these patients uh, had failed standard of care agents. They had, staled, they had failed VEGF inhibitors. They had failed immune checkpoint inhibitors. So these were very heavily pretreated patients. So for these patients, this is like a miracle. Uh, for these patients, however, not so much. So we have to figure this out. Uh, I should also point out that uh, Peloton, in addition to supporting this trial, agreed to treat 50 patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease who had multiple small tumors that were just being watched by in, in sort of a surveillance protocol. Uh, and so these patients had never been treated before with anything, uh, and they were just being watched. And the data won't come out for another couple months, but I can tell you, uh, and you young people are better at this than I am, uh, if you're good at social media and you go to the Facebook pages of the patients on the trial, you can see the drugs working because uh, some of the patients are actually posting their before scans and their after scans. I didn't think that was quite fair to them, uh, and I have redacted this patient's name. Uh, but th this patient's communicating to other VHL patients around the world that their tumors are shrinking, and you can see here, I never thought I'd see this day. Uh, so this is, you know, this is as good as it gets as far as I'm concerned. So what are we going to do about the patients who are not responding, however? So another concept that I've been enamored by for many years, I, I, I wish it had been my idea, uh, but other smart people had this idea long before me. Uh, and, and the idea was to apply the concept of synthetic lethality. So this is an old genetic concept where you have two genes, A and B, and where mutations in either gene alone are compatible with viability, but mutations in both genes simultaneously leads to uh, lethality. And so it was uh, Lee Hartwell and Steve Friend who suggested we should be applying this paradigm to cancer pharmacology. And if this was your, your favorite cancer gene, RB, VHL, P53, whatever, then we should find all the synthetic lethal interactors and we should target them. Because in principle, the drug that inhibited the B gene product here would selectively kill the cancer that had the sensitizing uh, mutation. So uh, like a lot of things in science, this all seemed really good on the blackboard. It's been a little hard in practice, at least in mammalian cells, but I think we're getting there. So for the past uh, decade, I would say, a number of papers have appeared where people attempted to do synthetic lethal screens in human cancer cells. And frequently the way this was done was to have tumor cells that were wild type for the gene of interest. So GOI here is gene of interest. So we have wild type for the gene of interest, mutant for the gene of interest, and then the cells would be infected uh, initially with hairpin libraries, but now people are using CRISPR guide libraries. And then you would do deep sequencing and look at the abundance of the hairpins or guides at the early time points versus the late time points. And you would look for hairpins or guides that get preferentially lost in the mutant cells as an indication that you're looking at a synthetic lethal interaction. So again, this all seemed fine, and there are countless high-profile papers where this was done, and almost all of them are wrong. So why were they wrong? So the first is, uh, just doing two independent infections already introduces some noise into the system. Uh, secondly, uh, if you really look at the methods, uh, these cells, although they were meant to be isogenic, are seldom truly isogenic if you consider even the heterogeneity within uh, any given uh, cell line. And then finally, getting back to up assays versus down assays, it's much harder to measure loss of something than a gain of something, and so looking for loss of hairpins and loss of guides is, is more problematic than enrichment of hairpins or enrichments of guides. So uh, we've come up with an embarrassingly simple wrinkle on this, and again for the students, simple is not bad, simple is good, okay? So don't be apologetic if you have a simple solution. It, you know, simple often beats complicated. So the simple solution here was we, we like to generate tumor cells that are going to express Cas9 so we can do CRISPR. We infect, we do one infection with a CRISPR guide library under wild type or pseudo wild type conditions, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. We then uh, monitor guide abundance, and then we split the cells 50-50 to continue under the wild type conditions, or we, we switch to the mutant conditions. And so we've now done this successfully for VHL, RB1, and uh, IDH1, another gene we're interested in. So let's just look, oh, oh, I should also point out, whenever possible, we corroborate these findings by doing parallel screens uh, using uh, isogenic human cells, but now using uh, chemicals rather than uh, CRISPR guides. And then we especially like, uh, with Norbert Paramon, running parallel screens using isogenic Drosophila cells using RNA interference. And we like this because, in our experience, if a gene scores as synthetic lethal in the fly, 
and its scores of synthetic lethal in humans, it's much more likely to be robust. Uh, and so we like getting that added confirmation. Secondly, as you probably know, there are many genes that are present as a single gene in Drosophila, but where due to gene duplication events, the same gene has multiple paralogs in human cells. And so that can lead to so-called paralog compensation, which can really muddy the water here. So we think there's a lot of a value here to having multiple sort of uh, uh, corroborating sorts of screens and assays. So for example, one way Hillary Nicholson did this was to take, again, BHL null kidney cancer cells, and she introduced a DOCS-inducible VHL. So she infected them under the cover of DOCS, so now the cells are VHL proficient. And then after editing occurred, she either continued the DOCS or removed the DOCS. And then in a parallel screen, she uh, infected the cells uh, that were VHL null, but now rather than having a DOCS-inducible VHL, she treated them with that Peloton HIF2-alpha inhibitor. Now, I should point out VHL does do things other than regulate HIF2, but this at least is one major thing that VHL does. So now at least we're really looking for synthetic lethality driven by deregulation of uh, HIF2. So one of the true positives from this uh, screen uh, was CDK4 and its paralog CDK6. Uh, it scored in our Drosophila RNAi screen uh, it scored it in isogenic human cells using chemical inhibitors against CDK4 and 6. It also scored in Hillary's human CRISPR screen with the inducible VHL that she could toggle on or off, but only if you looked at cyclin D1, which is the partner for CDK4 and CDK6. CDK4 and 6 didn't score in the CRISPR screen because, again, there's paralog compensation. They compensate for one another. Fortunately, in Drosophila cells, there's only a single ancestral CDK4, so it, it scored. And interestingly enough, this seems to be HIF independent. So for example, it did not score in that HIF2 inhibitor version of the screen. So just to show you what a validation experiment might look like, uh, Hillary took renal carcinoma cells that were VHL null. She restored VHL function and also had them express tomato red. Or she introduced an, an empty vector and GFP. She then mixed the cells one to one and then treated them in this experiment with a CDK4-6 inhibitor called abemacyclib, and now you can see over time outgrowth of the VHL plus cells at the expense of the VHL uh, minus cells. Uh, and then encouraged by this, she has also done in vivo uh, anti-tumor assays using orthotopic tumor models in nude mice. Uh, on the left, she made orthotopic tumors with a renal carcinoma cell line that remains HIF2 dependent. On the right is a renal carcinoma cell line that's HIF2 independent. She then uh, treated uh, the animals for 28 days with uh, a CDK4-6 inhibitor called palbocyclib. And uh, despite only 28 days, you can see an improvement in survival uh, in red. And actually, some of these animals were tumor-free at necropsy. So based on this, a clinical trial is about to begin with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Uh, now here, the reviewers said, this would have looked so much better if you hadn't stopped the therapy at 28 days. Why, Kalen, did you stop the therapy at 28 days? Well, the answer here was simple. This, this drug was given by oral gavage daily for 28 days. Uh, and after 28 days, most of my postdocs quit if I asked them to keep doing oral gavage with their mice. So uh, this turns out to be the LD90 for my postdoctoral fellows. If you go beyond 28 days, they, they leave my laboratory. So I think this made the point that this was probably a useful thing to do, but it wasn't very practical to continue. All right, so I've introduced to you uh, the, a, a, a class of enzymes that perhaps many of you haven't thought about, uh, these so-called two oxalate dependent dioxygenases. It includes the HIF prolohydroxylases, uh, the collagen prolohydroxylases. I mentioned the Jumanji C histone demethylases. Uh, we now know that the so-called TET enzymes are in this family, and what they do is they are responsible for helping demethylate DNA. Uh, there are many others. Some of these enzymes have not been studied. And I tell you this because uh, we now know that there are a number of cancer-causing mutations that cause the accumulation of so-called oncometabolites. And so, for example, uh, some cancers have inactivating mutations in succinate dehydrogenase or fumarate hydratase. This leads to the accumulation of succinate and fumarate, which at least in a test tube can inhibit these enzymes. In fact, you might have noticed succinate was the product of the reaction. And then we learned from Haiyan and Bert Bogelstein that some cancers have uh, neomorphic mutations in IDH1 and 2 that allow them to accumulate millimolar amounts of 2-hydroxyglutarate, which can also inhibit uh, these enzymes. And so 
This is sort of my unified field theory of oncometabolism that all roads lead to these enzymes. And then we and others in the field have begin are beginning to understand what are the relevant enzymes in terms of causing cancer versus which ones are simply innocent bystanders. So for example, in IDH mutant leukemia, uh, one of the relevant enzymes is clearly TET2, that DNA demethylation enzyme. Now, many of these enzymes are involved in epigenetics, and so almost immediately those pessimists and naysayers I warned you about a moment ago said, don't bother making drugs that, for example, block 2-HG production, because these cancers are going to be so profoundly rewired epigenetically that it won't be reversible. And so it won't help at that point to block 2-HG production. And so Julie Lossman in the lab decided to challenge that dogma. So again, one of the places where you see IDH mutations is in uh, leukemia. So uh, Julie generated isogenic leukemic cells that were either wild type for IDH1 or had this canonical IDH1 mutation, this R132H mutation. Uh, and then she either treated the cells with DMSO or a tool compound developed by Agios that blocks 2-HG production. So here she's measuring 2-HG, and you can see, as expected, the drug is having its intended pharmacodynamic effect. You're lowering 2-HG levels. Uh, she then did cellular proliferation assays. It turns out that these cells, the, at least the wild-type cells, despite being leukemic, uh, usually require cytokines to proliferate ex vivo. So if you now remove the cytokines, these cells stop growing in red. However, if the cells have the IDH1 mutation, now they grow perfectly well, even in the absence of cytokine. So now Julie took these cells, treated them with the tool compound, and they stopped growing. So once again, wonderful, terrific, let's start writing the paper. But I've told you the expected result is the worrisome result, right? Because this is the one you wanted, so you get lazy and you stop thinking, right? So I'd like to think this is all on target, but maybe this is true, true, and unrelated. The drug does have its intended pharmacodynamic effect, but maybe this is due to an off-target effect. What's worse is maybe both of these are due to an off-target effect, because they're both down assays. You know, we measured 2-HG, but maybe we, we could have measured any metabolite. But maybe we've simply poisoned these cells, and we could have measured any metabolite, and it would have gone down. So Julie uh, is, is a careful scientist, and she realized she had to do a, a, an additional experiment. And one of the experiments she did was, rather than uh, introducing the IDH1 mutation into these cells, uh, she simply treated the cells with an esterified version of 2-HG that enters the cell and then gets trapped. Okay, so you're now giving the cells artificially the 2-HG. Right? And if you give the cells 2-HG, uh, now they're insensitive to a drug that prevents 2-HG production by the mutant IDH. So do you follow me? So this says it's on target because if you give the cells the metabolite they were seeking, they're no longer sensitive to a drug that blocks 2-HG production. And not shown here is if you give this ester to these cells, they start growing uh, again. So this helped, I think, accelerate the development of these drugs for IDH mutant leukemia, and, and two of them are now approved. So that's the good news. The bad news is when you do similar experiments in the best available models of IDH mutant brain tumors, there's no effect. So here, this is data from my colleague Dan Cahill, but we have similar data. So this is an orthotopic tumor model with IDH mutant gliomas cells. Uh, you treat with an IDH inhibitor, you prevent 2-HG production, but you have no effect on cellular, uh, on, on, on animal uh, survival. And so this suggested to us maybe this is another place where we need to employ synthetic lethality. Maybe in the IDH mutant brain tumors, rather than blocking 2-HG production, we should be targeting the vulnerabilities that are created when you have high levels of 2-HG. So we've done this several ways. I'm just going to share uh, one or two. So uh, one was to collaborate with Joan Brugge. And again, as you've also probably sensed, I, have, I gravitate towards experiments that are simple enough that even I can understand them. Uh, so here we obtained a collection of chemicals that Joan assembled, and it's, a, it's an embarrassingly small collection of chemicals. It's only about 550 chemicals. So this is not a million, it's not 10 million, this is 550 chemicals. But because it's only 550 chemicals, Joan could array them in 384 well plates at 10 different concentrations, all right, which turns out to be very powerful. Because then what Sam McRae in my lab did was he generated isogenic 
uh, brain tumor cells that either had this canonical IDH1 mutation or he just infected them with an empty retrovirus. Uh, and he then treated the cells with these various chemicals and looked for chemicals that look like this. So here we're looking at relative cell number. In red are the IDH mutant cells, and in black are the IDH wild type cells. And so we're looking for examples where the chemicals preferentially kill the IDH mutant cells. And, and notice if we had just arbitrarily done our screen at one micromolar or 25 micromolar, you wouldn't have seen that there's a difference in the sensitivity. Now, we know this screen worked because here's the hit list from the screen. So I, you probably can't read this, but these are various chemical names. But the point is, in, in one screen, we rediscovered every reported synthetic lethal interactor with mutant IDH, including NAMT inhibitors, inhibitors of the electron transport chain, PARP inhibitors, et cetera. So that was sort of internal validation that the screen worked. Uh, but uh, what caught Sam's eye uh, are these yellow chemicals. So these are all pyrimidine synthesis inhibitors. Uh, now, another sort of take home for the students is th the least interesting explanation for your data is the explanation until proven otherwise. So the least interesting explanation for these data, in my mind, would have been, okay, there's a difference in the rate of proliferation of the wild type in the mutant cells. Uh, maybe the mutant cells have more cells in S phase. And so this is kind of trivial. Of course, you're going to get pyrimidine synthesis inhibitors. But there's an internal control, which is the purine synthesis inhibitors. So the red dots here are the pyrimidine synthesis inhibitors. And if they're shifted to the right, they're preferentially killing the IDH mutant cells. The blue dots are the purine synthesis inhibitors in the library, and they're not being skewed in one direction or the other. So uh, then uh, Sam went on to do some validation experiments. So we're now working with a pyrimidine synthesis inhibitor from Bayer that inhibits an enzyme called DHODH. And the reason we're focusing on this chemical is it crosses the blood-brain barrier well. And again, our goal is to treat brain tumors. So here, again, we have isogenic uh, so-called hog cells that are wild type for IDH1 or have this IDH1 mutation. This is cell death on the y-axis. And now we're treating with the Bayer compound. And you can see in red, the IDH mutant cells are undergoing apoptosis. But again, that's sort of a down assay. And so uh, we always, as you probably have now guessed, we like to do rescues. If you understand the biochemistry of this enzyme, you should be able to rescue these cells by giving uridine, and you do. So if you treat with the inhibitor, but you give the cells uridine, you rescue. They, don't, they no longer die. So this is on target uh, also. So why should IDH mutant glioma cells be so sensitive to pyrimidine synthesis inhibitors? And I also will tell the students, when I first started, I thought the hardest thing to do would be to think of the question to work on in the lab. And I just thought I'd be staring at the blackboard all day long trying to come up with a question. Once you get started and once you have some things working in your hands, it's surprising to me how often the next question is pretty obvious, right? So the question was, why should the IDH mutant tumor cells be so sensitive to the inhibitors? So we, we only partially know the answer, but I'll tell you the, the extent to which we know it. So we, we published uh, last year that another uh, target of the 2-HG is an enzyme called BCAT1. And BCAT1 uh, is required not only to make glutamate, as, but it also is required to make aspartate. And aspartate is needed for both pyrimidine synthesis and purine synthesis. But the pyrimidine synthesis is affected first because the enzyme that uses aspartate in the pyrimidine synthesis pathway has a lower affinity for aspartate. And if you do metabolomic profiling in cells that have low 2-HG or high 2-HG, you can see there's a block ex exactly where the block should be if the cells are being starved of aspartate. So I'm now going to completely uh, change gears and talk briefly about a drug called thalidomide that uh, in the 50s and 60s was available over the counter in some parts of the world for the treatment of morning sickness and insomnia. And unfortunately, if you were pregnant and took this drug, uh, there was a chance that your child would have these horrific limb defects known as the thalidomide uh, babies. Uh, but, uh, and that's probably where the story would have ended. But then in the 90s, through sheer clinical serendipity and dumb luck, uh, thalidomide and its cousins, such as lenalidomide, were found to be extremely useful drugs for the treatment of certain B cell malignancies, especially multiple uh, myeloma. And so now we have this terrible drug for limb defects, but it's a wonderful drug for myeloma. How does it work? So the foot in the door came from Hiroshi Honda, who immobilized thalidomide on a cephros bead and looked for proteins that could bind to thalidomide. 
And he identified a ubiquitin ligase that loosely architect uh, architecturally resembles the VHL ubiquitin ligase. But now Cerebon is the substrate recognition unit rather than the VHL protein. Uh, and probably because reviewer three demanded he do it, in his last figure he showed that if you added enough thalidomide, uh, you could inhibit the auto ubiquitination activity of this enzyme. So in 2010, this was all tied up with a nice bow that uh, thalidomide is a cerebron antagonist. But then what happened was clinicians, once again, sort of came to the rescue because what they noticed was when patients with multiple myeloma were treated with thalidomide and responded, but then later became resistant, often their resistant cells no longer produced cerebron. Conversely, the higher your levels of cerebron in the myeloma cells, the more likely you were to respond to the drug. Now, in all of these admittedly clinical papers, the discussion said this proves that cerebron is likely the target of the drug. And they then use words like is associated with response and all sorts of wishy-washy language. Uh, but this is where I think my mathematical training and computer science training helped because if you use words that have slightly more precise meaning, you can see things that you otherwise wouldn't. And if you think about it, this, these two observations said that thalidomide could not simply be killing the myeloma cells by inactivating cerebron. Because if that was the case, then getting rid of cerebron should not make you resistant to the drug. In fact, it would be a form of suicide for the multiple myeloma cells to get rid of cerebron. So this suggested to us and as it turned out to my colleague Ben Ebert working independently, that cerebron, once bound to a thalidomide-like drug, must acquire the ability to destroy a myeloma oncoprotein. So that was the hypothesis, that the drug was actually a neomorph. The drug needed cerebron to work. And so uh, Gang Lu in the lab made a vector where your protein of interest is fused to firefly luciferase, and then off the same transcript, he encodes ranilla luciferase, and now the ratio of firefly to ranilla can be used to infer things about the stability of the fusion partner. And then sort of a tour de force, Gong made a collection of about 12,000 of these. So he made 12,000 different fusions in that same vector. He then introduced these into 293 T cells grown in 96 well plates, where each well now is going to be expressing a different <laughs> luciferase fusion protein. He treated the cells with either uh, lenalidomide or DMSO. And then he looked for examples where lenalidomide was either stabilizing or destabilizing the fusion partner. And since this is published, I'll just tell you that uh, two of the true positives from this screen were IKZF1 and IKZF3, which turn out to be two otherwise undruggable proteins that are very important for the life of a multiple myeloma cell. And so our work and other people's work showed, again, using sort of necessity and sufficiency experiments, that downregulation of these two transcription factors was critical for thalidomide to kill multiple myeloma cells. So this has opened our eyes to new ways of drugging undruggable proteins. And so the idea here is, with, at least with the thalidomide-like drugs, they recruit a ubiquitin ligase, sort of like a piece of molecular glue, so that now you can degrade two transcription factors that turn out to be near and dear to multiple myeloma cells. So then the naysayers and the pessimists said, you'll never see this again. This is fascinating, but you'll never see this again. Now, that was actually not very smart because people who study plant biology had seen this years ago with a hormone called auxin. Uh, but fortunately, two groups almost immediately provided another example of certain anti-cancer sulfonamides that recruit a different ubiquitin ligase to recruit another undruggable protein, namely the RBM39 splice factor. But if you step back, we know that protein stability is extremely highly regulated. So you could imagine lots of other ways that a drug might at least indirectly destabilize your favorite uh, protein of interest. For example, maybe it would inhibit a dub, uh, maybe it would affect a post-translational modification or fold, et cetera. So the question we've been interested in for the past couple of years is, if we had been smart enough to know that IKZF1 was a good target in multiple myeloma, could we have run this assay in reverse and discovered the next uh, thalidomide. And so to do that, uh, Sagar Kaduri in the lab made 293T cells that expressed this fusion. He then took the 293T no, cells, grew them in 96 well plates, but now treated each well with a different chemical. So for proof of concept, he used a library of about 1,000 
uh, chemicals. Most of the chemicals do nothing, so that's good. Lenalidomide and its cousin pomalidomide score. So down here means a decrease in the stability of IKZF1, so that's very good. But most of this stuff is nonsense. Most of this stuff turns out to be complete and utter garbage. So for example, you get a lot of uh, HSP90 inhibitors in here that, you know, HSP90 is probably needed to, to fold that artificial fusion protein, and so you, you rediscover HSP90 inhibitors. But again, we want things that are a little bit more specific. And you know, we've talked about this multiple times today, but it really comes down to up assays versus down assays, because what I just showed you was a down assay. But I've already told you today that when people are setting up chemical or genetic screens, they prefer up assays, because first of all, the signal to noise characteristics are almost always better. So you can almost always see an up and a sea of downs faster than you can see a down and a sea of ups. But secondly, as we've talked about today, uh, when you do an up assay, you get fewer false positives because there are more uninteresting ways to make a complex system work worse than work better. So my, my thought experiment or Gedanken experiment for the students is if you don't believe me, uh, go out to your automobile later and start randomly removing parts from your internal combustion engine and come back and tell me how often the car goes faster. Okay, so that's your, that's your experiment. So Sagar Kaduri in the lab decided, let's make an up assay. So the up assay is protein of interest. It's now fused to a modified cytidine kinase gene. This modified cytidine kinase gene can accept a non-natural nucleoside called BVDU, converts it into a toxin. There's a little spacer here. Uh, and then another important feature is there's an iris and a GFP cassette. And that's important because what we're going to do is we're going to add a chemical or genetic perturbant, then we'll add the BVDU, and we look for green survivors. And by demanding that the cells are green, it, it ensures that the cells aren't surviving simply because they've sp spit out or silenced the reporter. So now let's take the same thousand chemicals and do our screen. We'll do it in 384 well format. So it turns out in this plate, two of the wells had pomalidomide, and so you can see the up. And then this turns out to be a chemical that interferes with BVDU incorporation, so uh, it's sort of an assay positive. Uh, we're now screening for new inhibitors or new degraders of IKZF1. So here the top plate has IKZF1 fused to CK. The bottom plate is unfused CK. Uh, each row has two different chemicals at 10 different concentrations. And so here on the top, you can see now here's an assay positive that scores in both plates, uh, whereas here's a novel degrader uh, called Spoutin that we're currently working up that turns out to be a true uh, positive. So we're now turning this technology to a series of undruggable uh, oncoproteins. And, and in closing, for the students, I've talked about naysayers and pessimists a couple times today. So this is, I think, the most famous picture in all of clinical oncology. You may recognize it. This is a patient who had metastatic melanoma with a BRAF mutation, uh, got treated with a BRAF inhibitor, went into this wonderful remission, but then within a matter of months was right back in hot water. And so this has led a number of people, both in the lay press and the scientific press, to say maybe targeted therapy is not the future. And so here, Jim Watson's basically saying, look, it's too complicated. This is never going to work. Cancers are too complex, et cetera, et cetera. And so you know, when I've heard Jim say this in front of young people, you can just see all the young people and you know, kind of slouch in their chairs because, of course, this is not very encouraging. I, I wouldn't have gone into cancer biology if I believed this. But what Jim has forgotten, apparently, and we used to teach this in the 70s and 80s, is that there's a classical solution here, and it's called combination therapy. So the idea here is that even a cubic centimeter tumor could have 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th cells. The tumor burden in most cancer patients is actually 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 12th. So even if you have a wonderful drug, but one in a million cells, one in a million cancer cells is resistant, either epigenetically or genetically, then the math doesn't work. And you get the picture I just showed you. But the classical solution is to combine, for example, three or more drugs that have distinct <coughs> mechanisms of action. And because they have distinct mechanisms of action, hopefully they're not going to be cross-resistant. And hopefully their toxicities will not overlap in a pro prohibitive way. So you can give them at full dose. Because then in a perfect world, the math works for you. So the chance of any one cell being re resistant to three such drugs is 10 to the minus 18. And we know this works because it's this is what the treatment of tuberculosis looked like 100 years ago, prior to the advent of combination chemotherapy. Uh, it's what AIDS looked like it was going to become in the 80s until we had combination chemotherapy. And frankly, I would say when we have cured cancers, 
uh, it's been with combination chemotherapy. And so I'm going to close with my re required reading for the, the, the students. We've talked about some of these ideas today, including controlling for on-target effects versus off-target effects. But I dedicated this piece to my wife, who was a breast cancer surgeon in Boston, who died of a glioblastoma in 2015. And I can tell you that one thing that became very clear to me was everything we had available to treat her with was based on science that was done 10 or 20 years ago. And so if, God forbid, our children and grandchildren get this awful disease, they're counting on the science we're doing today. And as I told you, my friends in pharma, pharmaceutical industry are telling me we all have to do a little bit better if they're going to be able to act upon the information we're publishing. So with that, I will thank you very much for your attention and be happy to take any questions. <laughs> It's a great honor to have uh, listen to your talk. Uh, normally, our uh, renal carcinoma shows uh, a low immune re re response during the Kitruda, Kitruda or Nibulma treatment compared to other aggressive carcinoma, melanoma, HCC, or colon cancer. Of course, protein used for the immunotherapy drug the first prime, first prime when I can talk about it, but uh, this drug has the ser uh, serious, uh, serious side effects, for example, VRS or pulmonary edema, and also shows low immune responsibility, lower than 20%. And some research, some researchers said that this aggressive carcinoma's low respons responsibility is connected to the hip on alpha and BJP expression level. What do you think about this? Red and carcinoma's low immune responsibility, uh, responsibility issue. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I completely agree with your premise. So first of all, kidney cancers are pretty famous for also uh, occasionally, it's rare, but occasionally undergoing spontaneous remissions. And one thought was that that was due to the immune system. Now, a, a checkpoint inhibitors have been approved now for the treatment of kidney cancer. So. It's true they're perhaps not as responsive as melanoma <clears throat> or mismatch repair colon cancers where there's a very high mutational burden compared to kidney cancer. Uh, but, we, uh, but it is true that kidney cancers do respond and some patients do benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors. So if you were working in my lab, uh, we might work together to try to understand why kidney cancer is immunogenic and how we can make it even more <coughs> Uh, immunogenic. And so you're, you are correct that a VEGF is thought, in addition to promoting angiogenesis, to suppress somewhat the immune system. And so maybe when you treat with a VEGF inhibitor, you're indirectly helping the immune response. Uh, we and others are also pursuing data that HIF can control endogenous retroviral expression. And we're testing, even as we speak, the idea that uh, this is also contributing to the immune response, endogenous retroviruses. Thank you for your great talk. I have two questions. Firstly, repeat accumulation of uh, is one of the hallmarks of CCRCC. So what is the mechanism of VHL or hip to alpha on lipid accumulation of CCICC? And secondly, VHL promotes protein degradation of hip one alpha and hip two alpha. So how is hip to alpha is major okay. hip alpha uh, in CCICC? Thank you. So let me start with the second question. So you're completely correct that VHL regulates both hip one and hip two. And it is also true that the two proteins are very similar in terms of their preferred DNA binding site. Uh, but having said that, it's very clear that there are some genes that are exclusively regulated by HIF2. Erythropoietin actually would be one of them. And there are other genes that are exclusively regulated by 
HIF1, such as certain genes involved in glucose metabolism. And presumably that re re relates to a number of factors, including chromatin accessibility, as well as interactions with other cis-acting transcription factors that maybe render certain genes permissive, if you will, to be activated by HIF1 and HIF2. And then others have suggested that HIF1 and HIF2 may also have some non-transcriptional uh, functions that might be important. So I would say we, our, our, our answer to your question is incomplete, but as, uh, I would say it's clear HIF1 and HIF2 have some very important uh, differences. Uh, and so I think that's the answer to the second question. Uh, the first question is, we have not studied so much how HIF regulates lipid metabolism in kidney cancer. Uh, uh, people like Celeste Simon, however, at Penn uh, have. Uh, and, and so I don't know that I can say anything intelligent because we haven't studied that very much. You know, w one of the things I, I'm always cautious about is uh, w when you see an abnormal phenotype, such as abnormal lipid accumulation, uh, is, it, is, it, uh, is, it, is it causing the cancer or is it sort of a, a consequence of the cancer? So I, I don't know yet how to think about the abnormal lipid metabolism in kidney cancer, but smart people like Celeste Simon are thinking about that and are also wondering whether that can be therapeutically targeted. Okay. Uh. Yeah, I have a question about the, the, the HIF2 arm bar gene diploma. And do you actually mention that or do you tell that the, the several different cancer cell lines, we, we share cancer cell lines for the HIF2 arm bar gene diploma, and you found that the, some of them didn't actually yeah, respond to that gene yes. And maybe you actually show that uh, since that if the genetic uh, in, in Bizarre interaction between the hip to arm bar inhibitor and uh, certain type of old, like the uh, cyclin D1 or the CD4 seeds. So, if you back to the, the, the resistance cell line and try to look at the expression of the gene, and do you find that uh, those uh, resistance cell line overexpress the CD4 seeds or the cyclin D1? So, that's a great question. So, uh, first of all, I should emphasize that. The synthetic lethality between VHL and CDK4 and 6 uh, does not appear to be driven by HIF2. And so one postdoc in my lab currently is uh, uh, asking whether there are non-HIF substrates of VHL that are also regulated by CDK4 and 6. So you have some preliminary evidence that such a protein exists. So that's, that's very exciting to us. Uh, Nonetheless, uh, when we were trying to understand why certain cells were resistant, we did look at things like cyclin D and CDK4 and 6, and we didn't see any obvious differences. Uh, we, we also looked at the status of various genes that are often mutated in kidney cancer, such as PBRM1 and BAP1, et cetera, and none of those seem to be uh, correct. So uh, we're still uh, in, in the darkness in terms of the molecular explanation for why some are sensitive and some are resistant. Uh, yeah. Just as a cautionary tale, though, to the students, when, when we were finishing the Nature paper, uh, we, we did have a renal carcinoma cell line yeah. that had spontaneously acquired a P53 mutation after being in my laboratory for years. Now, I'm embarrassed to say I think that was partly because some of the previous postdocs maybe didn't take very good care of the cells, and so we might have selected for a P53 mutation. And when we looked at those cells, they were resistant now to the HIF2 inhibitor. So the wild-type cells were sensitive. The P53 mutant cells were resistant. So we did, in our supplemental data, say we've observed this. And I would have bet my, my you know, money that that was the explanation. But we've now done the correct experiments, including using CRISPR, and it turns out that was not the cause of the resistance. They must have picked up some other mutations, but that just shows you how you can easily fool yourself because it was so appealing to think it was P53 status, but that's not the answer. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a much simpler question than the earlier ones. Um, um, I have a question on. Modern day drug development. 
Um, you mentioned that some researchers have found the target for the PPT alpha inhibitor, target site for the PPT alpha two inhibitor. Um, I was wondering how they found it, like how, how they found the target, and, and plus, uh, how would the, in modern day drug development, how would the people would um, the procedures or methods for screening the drugs, candidates? Um, I have a question on that. So y your question actually brings up two points in my mind. So first, let me directly answer your question. So uh, Rick Bruick is a molecular biologist, and Kevin Gardner is a structural biologist. And it was really Kevin Gardner's structural biology expertise that allowed him to look at the surface of the HIF2 alpha protein. And most drug hunters know that what you're looking for is a hydrophobic pocket of a certain size. And so he recognized that there was a hydrophobic pocket that was probably big enough to accommodate a drug-like molecule, and he turned out to be correct. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's how they got to the, the target, or, or that's how they got to the strategy. Uh, but I'm going to take an opportunity here to answer something you didn't know you were asking, but I'm going to say you asked it. Uh, my drug hunter friends and my pharmaceutical friends and my biotech friends say, we think it's great when people in academia do applied science and things that taste and feel like drug discovery and target discovery. We all think that's very nice, but we're pretty good at that too. But what we can never do is basic fundamental mechanistic work that you do in academia. Because you know, to go from those basic discoveries to application can sometimes take decades. And we all know in basic science, as you do basic fundamental work, you don't know where the road is going to take you. So most companies do not invest, for that reason, in basic fundamental work. Uh, and, and so they rely on us to do basic fundamental work. And uh, even though a lot of my work that I told you about feels like drug discovery, a lot of it was rooted in basic fundamental mechanistic work, like the oxygen sensing. And, and I think academics are now under too much pressure from funding agencies to justify the usefulness of what they are doing. I think we should go back to you know, curiosity-driven research, let's, let's learn some biology or chemistry or physics, and, and sometimes worry about the applications uh, later. So I, I think this was a very nice example of drug discovery done in an academic environment, but uh, I worry sometimes that we're moving too far in that direction. Okay, so uh, coming from that, I, I have a question. So based on the, the, the fact that oxygen sensing is quite important for the VHL in front of so do you, I mean, and you are developing novel methods for the drug uh, thing. So my question is that, do you think that uh, you would see differences if you had the endothelial vascular structure incorporated into your um, cell system to screen for the things? Yeah, I think that's interesting. You know, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a saying that uh, all, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So I, I could imagine our models would be even better if we tried to more faithfully re replicate the microenvironment. I, I think for some things, though, it really depends on the question. And you know, for example, are you really looking for something that kills cells in a cell autonomous matter yeah. or not? But I, I certainly can't argue with you that we could have much better ex vivo models yeah. that would include the micro en environment. And I think others have clearly shown that sometimes factors secreted by yeah. microenvironmental cells other than the cancer cells can contribute to resistance, for example. I, um, I'm trying to get into the grad school in a couple of years, or maybe next year. Uh, and like, do you have uh, any a word of uh, wisdom to uh, everyone? Sorry, so all the people here who are trying to get into grad school and pursue science. Yes. Well, Carlos, yes, sir. So uh, one of the, one of the things I always talked about with my own children, and my own children are now 27, 
and 24. <laughs> but when they were in school, one of our mottos was, don't peak early. You don't want to peak in high school. You don't want to peak in college. You don't want to peak in graduate school. You want to try to keep improving yourself. Okay? That, and so that has some implications. Uh, first of all, it means that you know, wherever you are, make the most of that experience, okay? and preferably uh, be at a place where you're surrounded by some people who are smarter than you are, because that's how you'll grow. But you know, if you don't get into the school you want, make the most of that experience, and then maybe the next level you do a little bit better. So for example, uh, the day or two after the Nobel Prize, the, uh, the, 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 at Harvard Medical School, there is a, a glee club, a, a musical uh, club, and, and they serenaded me because I won the Nobel Prize uh, in 2019. Uh, but I can tell you that when I applied to Harvard University in 1975, I got rejected. When I applied to Harvard Medical School in 1979, I got rejected. When I applied to Harvard to do my residency in 1983, I got rejected. So, you know, what did I do? I, I said, okay, I'm going to get to the best school I can. I'll learn as much as I can, and I'll, I'll try to prove them wrong. So, I think in 2019, when they had to sing to me, I, I proved they were wrong. Uh, one last question. Thank you very much for your nice talk. Uh, you started the slide, uh, but how you started the uh, research career? You know, if you have a chance. Uh, I would like to hear about your great uh, moments during your whole science career. And uh, when is your most uh, disappointing move? And how do you overcome that situation? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So I, I think I've already kind of shared my most disappointing moment when my professor gave me a C minus <laughs> and, and said I should never work in a laboratory again. Uh, then when I was in medical school, I briefly worked in a laboratory that was a better laboratory, but it wasn't enough to get me excited and it wasn't enough to make me believe I could be a scientist. And then by just sheer luck, I wound up in David Livingston's lab as a postdoctoral fellow shortly after the retinoblastoma gene had been isolated. And so now everything was good. I had a, I had a great project, a great mentor, a high-functioning laboratory. And since I was more or less the same person, uh, you know, I think that shows that the, the laboratory and the mentor matter. So I, I tell people that one of my lessons from this is if you're struggling in a laboratory, you might be the problem. But it could be that for you, this is not the right laboratory, or maybe this is not the right uh, uh, mentor. So I think, and, and I would even go one step further and say, you know, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you were smart enough to get into a prestigious university like SNU, and you're, uh, you know, if, if, uh, unless someone has completely beaten the curiosity out of you, you could probably do well in a laboratory if you, if you found it interesting and had the passion. Uh, but I'm sure you're probably all smart enough. I mean, I, I don't consider myself, you know, I, I would say I'm, I'm careful and I, I think I think about things, but I'm, I, I can point to any number of scientists who are infinitely smarter than me. Uh, but I was well trained and I, I try to think critically. And I do think for the students, I think in hindsight, the, the mathematical training uh, and the training in computer science and physics was probably more valuable to me than had I studied biology in the 70s, because what never goes out of style is thinking clearly and logically. You know, techniques come and go and, and models come and go. What never goes away is the need to think critically and clearly. Uh, and there's a book I would recommend for the students called How Not to Be Wrong. How Not to Be Wrong that I read a couple years ago, which is a wonderful series of little stories where the answer you would be sure was correct turns out to be wrong if you think about it a little more clearly and a little more logically. And it's a very useful exercise because, uh, you know, I read a lot of papers where I just go, oh my God, they're falling into the same trap again and this is a logical 
fallacy. So I think it's all about learning how to think clearly. Uh, but uh, David Livingston, my mentor, saved me scientifically. Uh, we have the students at the uh, students talk at two o'clock. So anybody who wants to have more questions and discussions and chat with Bill, please come to Morgan Hall at two o'clock. And, and I'd like to close by saying that I, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, Professor Lee for the question and you answered it. <laughs> I was watching the video that uh, was taken by Lasko Award when you said that actually I went to a science camp. Yeah, yes, yes. High school, and actually I wasn't that good there, but I met bunches of really smart kids, and I learned that I learned from smart people. Yeah, right, right, right. So this is the university. We boast that this is the number one university yes. in this nation, and worldwide is recognizing our, our graduates. So I think in years to come, we'll have more interesting and exciting results and the sciences from this university. Great. Thank, thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.